Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for having this um, conference. I know these conferences are very important to have because the goal is to edify the believers doctrinally so we're equipped to communicate the gospel because it's the gospel that has the power of God for salvation. And unfortunately, too many times, Christians get stumped on these kind of topics, particularly on the Trinity, because the Trinity is so neglected, and most folks, it seems, in the church have not been exposed to clear, just sufficient, accurate doctrine when it comes to the Trinity. Because of that, um, they misrepresent the Trinity. So thank you, Jeff, for having this conference, and we need more conferences like this so we can educate Christians just on basic stuff. It's not complicated, on basic gospel issues. And I would submit that the Trinity um, is a gospel issue. It's the gospel of the Trinity, that God the Father sent God the Son to die on behalf of his people, and God the Holy Spirit regenerates all the ones that the Father gives to the Son. Without the Trinity, there is no salvation. Um, my topic is text twisting by the cults and how to properly handle those texts. Now, of course, there's so many texts that Unitarians particularly twist. Um, and also, those who are the opposite of Unitarian, which would be polytheists and the henotheists, like the LDS Church, and they have their own spin on different passages. But many fall into the category of Unitarian in that they hold to the position of one person, that God has revealed himself as one person. And because of that, every verse they look at is seen through the lens of Unitarianism. So when we're talking about Unitarianism, we're not talking about the re necessarily the religion of Unitarianism proper, but groups who maintain a unipersonal or Unitarian view of God, like the Christadelphians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Oneness Pentecostals, they all hold to a Unitarian construct of God. And if God exists as one person, where does that leave Je uh, Jesus? Well, as I always mention, Unitarianism is, is a system of agents. Everything's an agent. So Jesus is an agent. He's not God creator. He's just an agent of the one person God. So see how their, their theology is formed by their presupposition of Unitarianism. Now, I assume all of you hold to the doctrine of the Trinity. If you're a Christian, I'm going to assume that you hold to the doctrine of the Trinity. All Christians hold to the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm also going to assume that you hold to the doctrines of justification. You hold to the doctrines of grace. You hold to the, the view that the vicarious life of Christ and his vicarious penal sacrifice is the very ground of our justification. I'm going to assume that. I'm going to assume that every single one of you holds to the, the doctrine of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to assume all that. Also, I'm going to assume after this conference, nobody's going to use Trinitarian analogies anymore. <laughs> and they're going to stay to the Bible. I've heard the most bizarre analogies that have to do with parts and, and the psychological model and the diamond and the egg and all these things. Just stay with the scripture. There's enough data to present the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is the most attacked, misrepresented, distorted doctrine by, as mentioned, religious, and I, as I call it, religious atheists. Now, I call any group that doesn't have the true God, I call them an atheist. Well, Paul had no problem calling those who had no hope. He said they're atheists in the world in Ephesians 2.12. Atheoi. That's what he said. You're an atheist if you don't hold to the true God. You're without God. So I call them religious atheists. When the nature of God is de-emphasized, the presentation of the gospel is presented as an incomplete gospel. It really is. And it becomes blotchy, disjointed. It's just not a gospel presentation. And the result of not being exposed to good doctrine on the Trinity, not being exposed to just basic stuff on the Trinity, is simply this. And I've seen it far too often. Many Christians, professing Christians that you talk to, 
When they explain the Trinity, they're functionally oneness in their explanation. Even though they don't embrace how oneness view God, that's how they explain it, right? Or they're, which is as worse, they're functionally LDS in their explanation of the Trinity. They explain it as three separate beings. I've heard that over and over. Three separate be- That's Mormonism. The three beings, the three gods for this planet. Same with justification. Too many Christians are functionally Roman Catholic in their explanation of explaining what justification is. Now, keep in mind though, because you have not been adequately taught, because someone has not been adequately taught the Trinity and they explain it in a very disjointed way or distorted way, that's different than a oneness Pentecostal saying, I reject the Trinity, I just don't believe it. Or because someone hasn't been taught adequately the doctrines of justification, but they say, I'm saved through faith alone, I'm putting my faith in Christ alone, that's different than a Roman Catholic saying, I am not saved by faith alone. It's just different. And of course, as mentioned, and I'll mention it again, it doesn't help when you use, in your explanation of the Trinity, these faulty analogies, because none of them work. Rather, we should all use the biblical data. Although Unitarians revise and they brutally distort the patristic record, um, particularly Jehovah's Witnesses and Oneness Pentecostals and Muslims, completely distort the patristic record, the church fathers, the early church. In fact, I was in a debate um, with this Oneness Pentecostal, it was my last one, and he actually said publicly in the debate, even though that wasn't even the topic, that all of the signers at Nicaea were all oneness. He said they're all oneness. He he did. Get the tape. Um, However, for the interest of time, I will not be focusing on patristic objections made by Unitarians and all the distortions that they make. I'll be focusing on some of the textual and translational uh, twisting and distortions that Unitarians commonly make on several passages. And of course, we don't have time, again, to go through every single passage. There's so many they, they distort. And note, to affirm the, a Unitarian God, you must disaffirm the deity of Christ. You, you would have to, um, except in oneness Unitarianism right? Oneness Pentecostalism. They're Unitarian because they believe God exists as one person. But they're the only that I know of Unitarian group that actually says, Jesus Christ is God. Well, how can they say that when they reject the Trinity? Well, in Oneness theology, Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is the one Unitarian name, and we that, that name is revealed in the New Testament. So when you see Jesus, actually you have to decide when you open up the New Testament, is Jesus speaking as the Father when He's speaking as a divine person? Or is He speaking as a Son when He's speaking in terms of His humanity? It's quite convoluted, but that's how they see Um, God as existing, as one person who is revealed in different modes or manifestations, which of course is completely different than persons. That's why when you uh, go to a popular guy like T.D. Jake's website on his church church website, and you read their doctrinal statement, it says, we believe that God exists in three manifestations. Now, your wife or husband is not a manifestation. And misrepresenting God, I mean, it is a huge issue. This is a fundamental issue. If I started teaching that your your mother or wife or husband, I started teaching to other people that they were half amphibious, you'd be very upset because ontologically she's human or he is human. Same with the nature of God. We have to be accurate ontologically who God is. So with one as Pentecostals, it's paramount to show that the Son is deity. It's paramount to show that the Son is unipersonal, meaning He's a distinct person. Same with the Holy Spirit. So when we deal with oneness Pentecostals and we say, Jesus is God, they'll 
put their thumbs up and say, Amen. But if you say the Son is God distinct from the Father, that changes everything because they don't believe it. They deny the eternality. They deny the unipersonality. They deny the deity of both or of the Son. And they deny the unipersonality of the Spirit because sometimes Jesus is the Spirit as deity. Sometimes He's the Father as deity. And then the other times, like when He died... He's the human son who is not God. The biggest, I think, fundamental problem with that is how in the world do you, as a oneness Pentecostal, have a relationship with the son? If the son's human, only human, and the son means the human flesh, and they, even they would agree the human flesh is not spread out all, all over the place. It's not like the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation where... You can take the, the elements here and it transubstantiates to his literal flesh, his literal blood, but yet someone across the globe does the same thing and they're partaking in his literal flesh, his literal blood. Well, that's a ubiquitous son. That's a ubiquitous human. That's not how the Scripture presents the incarnation. Being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man. Not ubiquitous man and some kind of X-man that can be all over the place. Well, one is Pentecostals do not believe that the Son is God, so how in the world can all one is Pentecostals have a relationship with the Son? That is a question that I ask all the time, because in Scripture, in 1 John 3 and other places, we have fellowship with the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit, and we do so because the Son is the two-natured person. He's the two-natured person. He's the God-Christ. That's why he said, I'll never leave you. And he can be with all believers at the same time in terms of his deity. When we worship God, uh, God the Son, we don't worship his flesh. We worship him because he's God, but distinct from the Father. Um, a couple noted Unitarians uh, I want to quote, but it's painful to quote them, but I'm going to do it anyways. Anthony Buzzard. He says this about, and I'm not going to spend a long time on this man. He says about the deity of Christ, many recognized biblical scholars do not think, however, that Jesus is called God in a Trinitarian sense. Many recognized scholars. Distinguished experts of the Bible, past and present, maintain that the doctrine of the tripersonal God is nowhere taught in the Scripture. In no, now listen, in no text did Jesus ever say he was God. I think every Unitarian this side of eternity makes the same statement. I've heard Muslims say it, Jehovah's Witnesses say it, Christadelphians say it. Nowhere, in no text, he says, did Jesus ever say he was God. And of course, most Unitarians equate the Trinity with really three gods, tritheistic kind of view of God. But one... I think a, a baseline premise for the Unitarians, they see the straight, uh, statement one God as meaning one person, right? My main supposition, or their main supposition here, is monotheism equals Unitarianism or Unipersonalism. It's interesting, that last debate I was, uh, well not the last, I, I debated a pastor in Missouri, a uh, UPC pastor, UPCI pastor. The whole town was oneness, it really was. There was 500 people in his church, and they all showed up, and six Christians showed up on my side. <laughs> um, even the town paper were oneness. They taught, without me knowing, they're so deceptive, they titled the, the debate, The Trinity versus One God. <laughs> I didn't know this until I was, I was finished. And of course, his whole presentation was all the verses in the Old Testament that speak of one God. Now we can see the fallacy there. We believe in one God. The Trinity is founded on monotheism. But they insert the idea of one person. So when they see one God, through their lens of the unregenerated Unitarian mind, they see one person. Today, <coughs> um, this supposition that we, their main supposition that we've heard, um, it was dealt with 
the issue of one God not meaning one person. And when they say one God, of course, they mean one God who is the Father. And there's many passages that they used, um, Malachi 2.10, uh, John 17.3, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and all these others. But um, I will be addressing some of the other key passages where the Trinity is affirmed, where they twist or deny or distort in some way the idea or the concept, exegetically speaking, where we find three distinct persons or two distinct persons. In fact, over, I think I counted over 60 times, do we find all three persons either in the same text, differentiated, or in the same context, in the New Testament. We find this. Unitarians naturally reject the Trinitarian formula, and that's what I want to look at when dealing with our first text, is Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. Now, it doesn't matter what translation you have because basically they all read the same way. It doesn't matter what Greek edition you have because the fact of the matter, there is no variant of Matthew 28, 19. We don't have any manuscripts that actually have a short reading, any viable readings that are short, meaning in the name of Jesus, as it's asserted by, particularly by Oneness Pentecostals. Now, the early church has been using... Matthew 28, 19, to affirm the three persons, um, starting Didache. I mean, it starts really early. And we see that the formula for baptism was a Trinitarian one. One of the reactions to this, either they deform the exegesis of the passage, or they just flat out deny that it's actually a reading just not in existence. And they will say or deny that it's some kind of late interpolation. Now, Oneness Unitarians, because they use this most, they argue their modalistic interpretation on two grounds, semantic and syntactical grounds. In other words, they deny or distort the meaning of the word name and then they distort the actual syntax, how it's arranged, how the words are actually arranged. So first, I'm going to look at, or deal with at least, a semantic error regarding the word name. Here's what they argue. If you Trinitarians are correct, and there's, that verse is speaking of three individuals or three persons, why in the world would the word in the Greek text there, anama, why would it be singular? Why would it not be plural if it's speaking about more than one person? Boom, I just refuted all the Trinitarians. That's one of their arguments. Well, number one, if simply, if anama, if, if the word name there was plural, like anamata, if it was names, right? Baptized in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, the problem there, it would certainly denote three separate beings. So, of course, it's not going to be a plural word there. But also what I found, which is very interesting, in Genesis 11.4, we see the, in the Septuagint, we see the same exact word translated name in Genesis 11.4, to denote multiple persons. Let us, they said, let us make a name for ourselves. It's singular. Showing the import in the Semitic mind of what name would have meant. Interesting though, it's just a side note, when they said let us make a name for ourselves, the verb translated let us make in the Septuagint, same one as Genesis 1.26. Now, what they don't realize is the singular, the name, in a Jewish mind, semantically, really meant simply power or authority, primarily. Power or authority. Um, 1 Samuel 17, 45, what does David say? I come to you, to the giant, with a spear, a sword, a javelin, or you come to me with a spear, a sword, and javelin. I come 
in the name of Yahweh. He wasn't claiming he was, his name was Yahweh too, but he comes in the power and authority of Yahweh. In Acts 4, 7, when the officials were questioning Peter and John, they said, by what power or what name have you done this? And even today, do we not say, we see that in movies all the time, stop in the name of the law. But in a Jewish semantic mind, it denoted authority and power, just like in these passages. So, when you look at Matthew 28, 19, the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, we find are bonded ontologically together, sharing the nature or power or authority of Yahweh, of the single name, not Yahweh's, but under the authority of Yahweh, because the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Holy Spirit is Yahweh, and they share the nature of the one being. They are bonded ontologically under that authority and name. Let's look now at the syntactical error of particularly, again, oneness advocates. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that passage, they will say, are merely the three modes or three manifestations of the one unipersonal deity, and his name is Jesus. Right? That's how they see the passage. However, first of all, the text, note this, the text does not read in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which would really support that view. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It doesn't read like that. And that would be consistent with oneness doctrine. Right? Because all three are governed by one article. But it doesn't read like that. That's not what the inspired author wrote. Nor does the text read, <coughs> in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's singular, not plural. Because that would also imply three separate beings. Nor does the preposition ace, translated in or into, is repeated. We don't find a repeated preposition as with this reading, in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit, what would also be construed as three beings. Rather, what the inspired text reads, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I say, I, I repeated those articles, the and the conjunction and, I repeated them parenthetically so we can see the construction in the Greek text. There's a repetition of the article before each noun, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, while the conjunction and connects them. Just basic Greek. And there's a rule, um, a syntactical construction called Granville Sharp number six when you have a repetition of the article before singular personal nouns, right, descriptive nouns, and connected by chi or the conjunction, right, this construction denotes distinct persons. Distinct persons. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where all three persons are grammatically distinguished from each other. Um, 1 John 1, 3, where the Father and Son are grammatically distinguished from each other. Also in John, 1 John 2.22 and one of my favorites, Revelation 1.13, where we read the, the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb. And both objects are receiving the same worship, the same glory and dominion <coughs> forever and ever. In terms of textual evidence, um, as mentioned, they just deny that the text even reads that way. Well, they deny it because that long Trinitarian reading is not found in some of the earliest manuscripts. But so what? There's a lot of readings that aren't found in the early Greek manuscripts. Uh, so from that, they would argue it's just not there. Well, if you look at the manuscripts, 
Every single manuscript of 2819 of Matthew contains the Trinitarian formula, not a short reading, right? All of them. And what's very interesting is in verse 18, there's variance. In verse 20, there's variance. But there's no variant for the Trinitarian formula. Also, um, citing Eusebius doesn't help because it was, first of all, he cites both the, long, the short and long, but it just doesn't help because many church fathers quoted in a paraphrase, paraphrase fashion. But he quotes both, long and short. But the fact is the Trinitarian formula has been consistently used by the early church starting very early from the Didache, a Trinitarian formula. In fact, I found at least 24 pre-Nicene church fathers pre citing the Trinitarian formula. 24 church fathers citing the long formula. So, Let's go to our next text in John 1.1. 1, 1. Now, John 1.1, 1, 1, I think, is one of those texts that refutes all the cults. It refutes all the bad theology by Unitarian atheists, by Jehovah's Witnesses, by Muslim. It just refutes on so many accounts, on all three clauses. From the first clause, denoting the eternality of the Word, from the second clause showing the distinctions between the Word and the Father to the third clause, John 1.1c, what a beautiful affirmation that God was the Word. Emphatic there, God was the Word. But, and I get questions sometimes um, through the email from a zealous Christian who is telling me their encounter with Jehovah's Witnesses and how they just, you know, dumped Greek on them, showing how John 1 means God and not a God and all these things. Well, we know grammatically it's possible to have an a God re rendering. It's possible. But it's not theologically possible because that would go against John's own theology. But what solidifies the deity of Christ in John 1 1 C, it's not so much the grammar there. It's the context of the prologue. Because it's the context of the prologue that tells us that He was God. In verse 3, He was the, the, uh, the creator of all things. Panta, di alto, agenita, all things through Him. In verse 4, He's life. Right? In verse 6, John the Baptist was a witness not to a concept, not to something in the Father's mind. He was a witness to the person of the Lamb. In verse 10, He's the Creator. In verse 14, He became flesh and He dwelt among us. And in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. So that wipes out all the views of the Mormons. Nobody's ever seen God, the Father. No one's ever seen God, monogamous theos, the one and only, our only begotten God. But even if you hold to a TR reading, only begotten Son, it still doesn't help the Unitarians when they argue, well, it's only begotten Son there. Because it's the next phrase that shows the eternality of the person of the Son. No one's ever seen God. The monogamous theos, or even if you hold to the monogamous huyas, the only begotten Son, the next phrase is an articular participle Ha'on, meaning timeless existence in this context. When you have the articular participle here, same with Romans 9.5, as Raymond says, it, 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 does, it denotes a, a, a timeless existence, the one always being. He's eternal. In the kopos, the bosom of the Father. By the way, the word kolpos is synonymous with intimacy. Every single time it's used in the Gospels, that's what it denotes. One time it's used in Acts to denote a bay, you know, or in a creek, a bay, or a gulf. But that's not the context here, nor is it the context in Romans 9.5. Or is it the context 
in all these other places where the, the word is actually used, kolpas. He's always in the bosom of the Father, eternality. He's always in the bosom of the Father. He has exegesita. He has revealed or exegeted the Father. So in John 1, 1, it's the context that tells us Jesus was God. Um, now, in the Unitarian or the oneness mind, they will see the Logos as merely your thought or the Father's thought. They'll say, you have a thought. It's always with you. Well, the Father had a thought. The Logos was merely in the mind of the Father. Now, the problem with that is, now, they sneak this premise in. They sneak this precept in. When they say only, only in the mind of the Father, notice the word only. Well, of course, the Son's in the mind whatever that actually means, in the Father, but it doesn't mean only in the mind. My wife can be in my mind right now, but she's, she, she's existing. So they sneak in the word only. They see the Logos as only in the mind. And also, they appeal to the phrase uh, with the God, literally, prostantheon, and they go to places like Hebrews 2.17 and Hebrews 5.1, where it says, pertaining to the things of God. And they say, see, it's, it's the things. But number one, dealing with this phrase, and the word was with the God, in John's prologue, again appealing to the context, John presents the prologue, as mentioned, with personal attributes. John was a witness, John the Baptist was a witness, not to a concept, but to the person of the Word, the Lamb of God. And we saw in 18 <clears throat> how Jesus has intimate fellowship. He's always timeless, existing in the kolpas, in the bosom of the Father. Personal attributes. Number two, the word pros, um, and the, the linguistic sources of this are abounding. It could denote intimate fellowship, like Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified from faith, we have peace, prostantheon, with the God. And there's many, many other passages, but what about Hebrews 2.17 and 5.1, where it's translated, in most translations, the things uh, regarding or pertaining to God? Well, Simple, there's no syntactical parallel because in John 1, 1, B, we have hein prostantheon, an imperfect. The word was with the God. Whereas these places, these only three places in Hebrews 2.17, 5.1, and Romans 5.17, there's a neuter article. So of course it's going to be translated ta prostantheon. So there's no syntactical parallel. They're grasping Lastly, and I think this is important, um, in the New Testament, the phrase, with the God, or prostantheon, that's used in John 1, 1b, is used 20 times in the New Testament. Now, three times you have the neuter, only three. So they really don't apply. But all of them denote distinct persons, person or person who was with God. All of those places, except where the neuter, obviously, they denote a person or persons with God. All right, let's go to our next passage. John 17, 5. Now glorify me now, Father, together with yourself, with the glory I shared or I had before the world was with you. That's how it literally reads. Now, if you just open your Bible and read it just plainly, you would never get the idea that Jesus, the Son, was praying to his own divine nature or that the Father had glory with the plan that this plan that the father had 
someday I'm going to be sending my son to redeem the world. You would never get that idea. You would never get the idea that it's a unipersonal deity as a referential identity. You would just read it plainly, hey, that's the person of the son praying to the person of the father. Well, Unitarians see the glory that Jesus had was not in the pre-existence, but they see it, and I'll explain this, they see it as a, as a it's really bizarre, a proliptic sense. A proliptic sense is really uh, where you have a, past, a real past tense, right? But it describes a future event as though it was already accomplished. Now, there are proliptic um, verbs in the New Testament. For instance, Romans, Romans 8.30. Right? Romans 8.30. These whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, we would see that we're not glorified yet, but Paul's so certain of the event, he puts it in this, this past tense, or this, this uh, he puts it in, literally in a past tense to denote something that's going to happen for sure. He's so convinced it's going to happen, he puts it in the past tense, like the other verbs in the order of salutis here. However, there's a couple things. First of all, polyptic, polyptic verbs, are, they only, only occur in the New Testament, in, and I'll explain this, in an arius indicative, rarely in a future. There's no such thing, as we see in John 17, 5, as a, a proliptic imperfect, because that's the tense that is used by Christ. The glory that I had, it's an imperfect, past ongoing event, or repeated action. There's no such thing as a proliptic imperfect. So they're just throwing things at you. Why can't I just look at the passage and just let it speak? It's not complicated. Jesus says, the glory that I had, uh, that he shared, not in the Father's mind, but that he actually shared. Uh, a couple more things on this. The word Father is in a case of direct address. He's directly addressing the Father. It's in an actual vocative case. He's addressing the Father. He's speaking to the Father. Direct address. There's no such thing in the New Testament as what's called a, as I call it, a reflexive vocative, meaning where someone's commanding themselves, oh, me of little faith. I mean, we don't have anything like that. There's no, it's completely unexampled as we'll see in the same thing with uh, Hebrews 1.10. Further, this phrase, with him, or together with yourself, uh, the preposition para with the dative case there, we look at this in the New Testament, how it's used. First, their, their objection is, it means in the mind. It only means in the mind. Well, Yes, there is a definition for this in the mind. Actually, it's appealed, they appealed to Thayer's lexicon, where it gives a definition of para and the dative as being in the mind. But a couple problems with that. Thayer doesn't apply that meaning to John 17.5. And he, I'm, he, doesn't, he doesn't give an actual verse that says para with the dative um, is exampled by an actual Bible verse. He's saying it could mean that. But what he says of John 17.5, he says, near or besides, para to theo, dwelling with God, John 8.38, equivalent to in heaven, John 17.5, end of quote. So he applies something that we hold to. Robertson says, this is not just an ideal pre-existence, but an actual conscious existed at the Father's side, which I had before the world was. Also, another statistical note, para with the data is used ten times in John's literature. Ten times. Every single time, it denotes distinct side-by-side -side person or persons. Every time. There's no in-the-mind reference in John. Look at John 14, uh, 14, 23. Whoever hears me will obey my word, and the Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our abode para alto with him. First, if you notice in John 14, 23, you have two future 
plural indicatives. We will, who's we? The Father and Son, Jesus and His Father. I think this is a very productive passage with one as Pentecostals. We will come to Him and we will make our abode with Him. By the way, the verb here, we will make, is the same plural verb, the same plural verb as Genesis, again, the plural of poeo, the same as Genesis 1.26. We will make our home with Him. We have distinct persons all over the place. Interestingly, I wanted to mention this. Um, we heard a great presentation of early patristics by Dr. White about the affirmation of the deity of Christ. Um, and he quoted Ignatius. I found this linguistic parallel in Ignatius' writing to John 17.5 where the same prepositions are used, at least a preposition pra, and the para with the dative is used. And it, listen to what he says in Magnesians uh, chapter 6. Jesus Christ who pra, before the ages, prepositions used in John 17.5, para patri hain, with the Father was and appeared at the end of time. It was almost identical to John 17.5. And the fact is, no koine Greek lexicon or standard grammar offers an in-the-mind in rendering for John 17.5. In fact, the imperfect shows Jesus always possessed the glory. And when did He always possess the glory? Prata tu kosmon and I. Before the world was, and He says, I had it with you. He uses para with the dative twice. Together with yourself, the glory I had together, right? With the glory together with yourself that he had before the foundations of the world, he says, with the Father, with you, parasoi. Our last passage, and there's many, but I wanted to particularly end with this, uh, Hebrews 1.10. Because Unitarians like Dale Tuggy who debated Michael Brown not too long ago, actually, his response to this was so, it really made my stomach ache. I mean, it was so bad. Uh, and I thought Brown re responded well. And Anthony Buzzard, they both used the same arguments. Now, if you read Hebrews 1.10, just simply, in whatever recognized translation you have, it's just a simple, dimple passage. Now we know that contextually Hebrews, the prologue, is a, a beautiful contrast between heaven, the earth, and angels, everything created, and the eternality of the Son. We find that the Son is the final revelation in these last days. Uh, in, in verse 2, the Son is, is presented as the, as the agent of creation. The agent. As John 1.3 and Colossians 1.16 and 17 point out. That's in verse 2. Also in verse 3, we find he's the uh, ha-on. He's the one always in the radiance of the glory and the character, the exact impress or representation. Te um, supostosios. The nature of the nature of God. Of Him. Not as Him. Of Him. Now, and here's where we get to some of the, um, I think, to expose their false accusations of Hebrews 1.10. In verse 3, the father, or in verse 6, the Father commands the angels to worship the Son. However you want to take verse 10, in verse 6, the Father commands all the angels to worship the Son. And the commandment is so strong, it's in the aorist imperative, it's stressing the urgency. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, let all the angels worship him. Worship the Son. Then in verses 8 through 13, we read of the Father directly addressing 
the Son. In verse 8, dealing with our text in verse 10, in verse 8 we have the clause, but about the Son, he says. So we know that the Son is the referential identity. About the Son, he says. Right? In verse 8. So the Son is the direct, in direct address, the Son is the referential identity of the, this direct address by the Father. Again, the Father is directly addressing the Son. Now, Unitarians like Anthony Buzzard and Dale Tuggy actually see verse 10, which reads, And you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hand. Right? Well, it's a clear passage, but they interpret it as, because of their Unitarian precepts, denying the deity of Christ, they see this verse as speaking of a new city in the future, of some new creation in the future. A future, or as Buzzer says, a, a world to come. Same with Psalm 102. Now, referring to the prologue of Hebrews, Buzzard, ex Buzzard explains, if the Son were God, there would be two gods, which is common in terms of a Unitarian view of the Trinity. So the starting premise, this very starting premise, hey, if Jesus were God, there would be two gods, is the very bedrock upon which all forms of Unitarian really are mounted. But of course, a plain reading of this passage with the Quotation in Psalm 102, 25 through 27, easily shows the ridiculous errors of this crazy view that it's dealing with a future city. First, again, it's the context of Hebrews chapter 1, which is an ontological contrast between the Son and everything else created. In verse 10, it starts off with a conjunction and, referring back to verse 8, but about the Son. In fact, through from verse 5 on, there's five different conjunctions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are your work of your hand. In the next verse, verse 11, says that the present heavens and earth will perish. The present heaven and earth will perish. It refutes this weird idea of a future world. And also, Technically, and this is where I think what completely annihilates this oneness or this Unitarian view that is speaking of a, of a future world, it's that the Son is directly addressing, or the Father is directly addressing the Son. The word that's used when he says, you, Lord, the word for Lord is kudai, which is the direct address case for the word Lord. Right. So he's speaking to the Son. He's directly addressing the Son. Never do we find, and this is an important point, the word kudai in the vocative, never do we find that word in a future prophecy. Not in the Scripture. We, don't, we just don't find it because it looks back to creation, not a future prophecy. Again, refuting this weird voodoo kind of fantasy of a future new world that Tuggy and Buzzard have. And also, contra to oneness Unitarianism, the vocative curiae, it appears in the whole New Testament, appears 120 times. And every single time, the subject of direct address is always directing a distinct person, the Lord. Always directing kudai, it's a distinct person addressing the term Lord when Lord is used in the vocative every single time. Three times we find that the vocative is used to denote other things, like for instance, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death is directly is in the vocative. It's addressed. Uh, twice in Revelation 18, 20, where heaven but the person is still distinct from the thing he's addressing. Finally, Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 is a citation from Psalm 102, 25 through 27, where the object there, where the, the subject matter there, I should say, is the Yahweh, the immutable creator of all things. But the Father is directly addressing the Son, using a vocative form for Lord and saying, You, Lord, are the one I'm speaking about from Psalm 102. 
The Father affirms the Son is the Yahweh of Psalm 102, 25 through 27. It's irrefutable, which in the debate, I believe Brown brought that up, but Tuggy just ignored it, went on to something else. But this is one, uh, one of many places in the New Testament where the author clearly envisage, envisages the Son as the Yahweh of a particular Old Testament passage. So in conclusion, in the Unitarian mind, um, we have to understand they naturally distort these kind of passages. Naturally. These passages that unambiguously affirm distinct persons. And that's really what the Trinity is predicated on, distinct divine persons. And affirm the unipersonality, the deity, and pre-existence of the Son. And we know that for us, our job, our duty, is to present God, the triune God. Not merely John 3.16 and a whole host of sanctification passages. But we have to present the Gospel. And the Gospel is the Trinity. And it's only by the election of grace that the mercy in God will grant them faith, repentance, and the knowledge of the Trinity, like, like He did for us. We know in Romans 16, that the only recognized gospel is the gospel of God the Son, who God the Father sent, as we read in 6.38, Apatu Urano, from the heavens, God the Son was sent by God the Father to live a vicarious sacrificial life, substitutionary life for us, and whose death was a vicarious death, on behalf of all the ones that the Father gave to him. It truly is a gospel of the triune God. As the Nicaea hymn reads, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Thank you.